On a Monday, we'd like to check in with the Australian Christian Lobby. Dan Flynn from the ACL is with us once again. Hey, Dan, welcome back to 2020. Thanks, Neil. Great to be with you. Hey, Dan, let's start with uh, it was going to, a couple of a uh, couple of issues overseas this morning and a couple of issues here on our shores in Australia. Let's start with a development in the United States. And there's been a couple of rulings from the U.S. Supreme Court, one that overturns what's called affirmative action in university recruitment policies. As uh, complex as that sounds, it all has to do with universities and people's placements and all sorts of things with quotas and such things. What's the development that's happened in the U.S. and how that might relate to us? Well, what's happened is very significant, Neil. This became available to a a ruling on uh, Friday uh, that on our Twitter feed uh, came up that um, uh, the idea that uh, if you were um, a black, Native American, uh, Hispanic, that you would be able to get into Harvard over and above somebody who wasn't of those races. Uh, That's been in place since the 1970s, Neil, uh, but was reversed in a 6-3 ruling of the US Supreme Court on Friday. And um, fascinating statements um, uh, as the court removed this sort of racial division. So there was, um, uh, you could be knocked back because you were white. And this was happening at prestigious colleges like Harvard. Um, uh, a black uh, U.S. Supreme Court judge, Judge Clarence Thomas, um, uh, made this point, that racial categories are little more than stereotypes, suggesting that immutable characteristics somehow conclusively determine the person's ideology, beliefs and abilities. And he said, Neil, that he holds out this enduring hope that the country will live up to its principles that all men are created equal, are equal citizens and must be treated equally before the law. So with that, um, those words, Neil, the um, uh, this system of um, affirmative action was abolished. Uh, Neil, the it has implications, I think, potentially for the way we're looking at going ahead in Australia with the voice, uh, which is... Um, uh, that will be an institution whereby you will have to be or identify as Aboriginal to be a part of, and it is a significant chamber uh, who will um, wield great influence, um, unelected influence uh, in our politics. And I think it's just worth reflecting on, Neil, um, that the US Supreme Court has just said it is wrong to divide on race, uh, and we are poised to say that it's right to divide on race in relation to the voice. I'm not sure of your response to that, Neil, but it's a concern. You know, it is a concern, and uh, it reminds me just in the weeks gone by, there's been that controversy that's arisen in New Zealand uh, where there were going to be some, based on race, who might have even had preference uh, in admission to a hospital. Uh, So you've got this growing sentiment now and an understanding coming out of the US around universities that when you've got people who are of one race and maybe having some preference over another race, that somehow or other you've got to have an equalising factor. And so this comes back to the American Constitution in what's happened there, Dan, because the American Constitution actually has an equality uh, not based on skin colour, but that already is something that's in place. So they're not likely to have the sort of voice controversy that we're having in the discussion about this change to our constitution. That's absolutely right, Neil. The voice would not happen in the US because of that um, equality of the races. It's something to reflect upon. Uh, Christians have various views on the voice, uh, but the division on race is a point that Uh, is concerning to us as an organisation. And just to zero in here and make sure we're reflecting on this in a right way here, Dan, because uh, what you're saying is here in Australia, we also have a constitution that says uh, there is no preference given to anyone because of skin colour. But what Mm. we might face in the voice, if there is a voice, uh, that there might be preferential, preferential treatment given to skin colour if there is a yes vote that goes ahead. Now, it is controversial. People are thinking about the issues and wanting not to be ignorant, wanting to understand what the potential for the outcomes might be. But that is one of those things that you've got to pay attention to, is there will be a change if there is a yes vote. 
That's correct, Neil. That's correct. And, you know, as people uh, weigh the competing considerations, um, you know, I would just simply put that in the mix, uh, that you have um, uh, a group that's a, uh, a, a high-level advisory chamber of the parliament, um, not quite of the parliament, but certainly recognised in the constitution, um, and uh, uh, is race-based. Um, that's got to raise a few questions. Now, there's been a couple of very interesting and some will say controversial decisions that have come out of the US, the US Supreme Court. Uh, another one is around a, a website maker. What's the detail here in your understanding, Dan? Well, there's a, a wedding website designer. Her name is Laurie Smith, and uh, she appealed a Colorado anti-discrimination law um, that um, where she was saying this law would make her create websites for same-sex couples and thereby compelling her to endorse those um, marriages. And uh, as a Christian, she said that violated her First Amendment right uh, to free speech. In other words, she didn't want to be compelled to say something. Um, again, in a 6-3 ruling, uh, representing, I think, the uh, conservative, um, uh, I suppose, domination of that court, uh, the court found that, uh, yes, uh, Laurie Smith does have a right not to create a website for a same-sex um, uh, wedding. Uh, she has a right um, not to be forced to make some sort of um, design um, uh, for a message about which she disagrees. So that's a wonderful, wonderful development. Neil, and, you know, we're seeing a little bit of light uh, there in terms of freedom uh, for religious people who are in business. And isn't it interesting, when you're a religious person in business, a Christian person, you're applying your ethics, and uh, there'll be division here, because, uh, and it may be that there's no right and wrong, because one Christian will say, well, if someone's prepared to pay money for my service, it doesn't matter what mm. sexuality they have, doesn't matter what skin colour, mm. nothing really matters, mm. uh, I'm providing a service, mm. and they're paying money, and I'm going to deliver uh, the business as I deliver. On the other hand, you've got someone who says, with my conscience... I won't be exposing my staff or I won't be myself uh, putting my own business into something that compromises my religious belief. And so you've got both sides may actually be legitimate. The interesting connection here, I'm thinking, Dan, I'll get your thoughts. If you're taking an artistic approach, as you do when you're mm. doing graphic design, <clears throat> that if you are compromised in your artistic approach because of your religious beliefs, that's also even connected to with what might be a political message in there. So all of these things are connected. Uh, any thoughts here about, you know, the, the fact that you've got to have some level of freedom of conscience, freedom of speech? Well, well it's very important, Neil, and uh, particularly something that's lending creativity, uh, a wedding photographer, um, uh, a wedding cake maker, are now a website designer. Uh, you are all in as an artist, creating something beautiful to celebrate an event. And if it's something that you that is against your conscience, you shouldn't have to do it. And um, yeah, like we actually don't have those freedoms in Australia. Now I draw a distinction between someone driving a taxi who said, I'm not gonna pick up a same sex couple. That's different. Um, and um, we have to be astute to draw the distinction between um, Ninety-eight percent of services provided, and something that's artistic that relates to our freedom of speech, um, and that was what was at stake here. So, as you say, we don't have these freedoms in Australia to say no. Do you know how things stand right now, Dan? How do you reflect on that? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the the bottom line is at the moment that you don't have a right to discriminate against a, a protected attribute or a protected class. That's that's the way things stand at the moment in Australia, and it's probably going to get worse, Neil, because of some legislation that's afoot in New South Wales. Uh, and that's, uh, that's concerning us as well. You're referring to Alex Greenwich's equality bill, and uh, he's pushing this fairly hard. What's the update here? Well, um, it's called an omnibus bill because it contains everything. Um, he wants uh, people to be able to uh, just simply fill out a form and change their gender on their birth certificate and license, um, and just on application, fill the form out, apply, and get it done. Um, uh, he also, uh, the second aim of the bill is to remove any religious protections that currently exist in 
anti-discrimination laws. And uh, it may be that in some uh, parts of discrimination legislation that people have a right to conscience. Uh, there's an element of that in the Victorian legislation. Uh, all of that would go. Um, the third element of this is to do with conversion practices and that um, uh, the idea that uh, if you're to involve in any sort of religious uh, teaching that would assert that homosexuality is sinful um, and, you know, could result in eternal separation from God, if you said something that plain and bald, uh, that would be a conversion practice, um, as we would expect Greenwich would want um, banned. Uh, so these are all great concerns. And um, uh, somehow, Neil, um, these are so ideological and we, you know, people wave a yes flag too. Um, but I'll tell you who's not being fooled, Neil, the health insurer, uh, MDA. Uh, you might have heard, Neil, that just in the last week or so, Australia's largest medical insurer has said, look, we are not going to uh, insure doctors if they're involved in um, gender transitioning treatment um, for under 18 year olds. So uh, great for Alex Greenwich to be very theoretical and you know um, a lot of virtue signaling, but on the ground, um, the medical insurers are saying, no, we, they're actually being very clear, Neil, saying, no, we cannot quantify the risks associated with regret. So we are pulling out as insurers. So this problem is real and um, uh, this is an encouraging thing, perhaps encouraging a little bit like the US decision, but something encouraging in Australia. And perhaps because it's not just a simple one-off surgery, but a lifelong medicalisation for whoever goes through those treatments. Hey, just to be clear here, Dan, in case uh, listeners are thinking, well, what should I be thinking here? You've got this omnibus bill. And uh, it's mm. supposed to be, you know, all covering. In fact, Alex Greenwich mm. says it's time to remove all remaining discrimination of LGBTQIA and communities and achieve holistic equality. Now, holistic mm. equality, what that means for the Christian. I'll get your thoughts here because uh, it obviously tramples religious freedom because Christians become a target. And the reason why Christians become a target is because... They hold to an unchanging, and it won't change any time soon. Mm. The Bible is the Bible. Mm. It's God's word, yeah. a biblical view yeah. of sexuality and marriage, and it will come into conflict with that sort of holistic yeah. equality approach yeah. that Alex Greenwich is pushing. <clears throat> that's where that's where Christians, that's, you know, I guess, a sober way of saying that's where Christians stand. Get ready, because if this goes through, you'll be all the more the target. Is that the case? That's absolutely the case, Neil. And the idea of holistic equality... Uh, it's what I'd call it, you know, an asymmetric equality, uh, loud and clear for the LGBT plus community. Uh, but for Christians, uh, it is be silent, uh, do not express your views, do not write, do not publicise, uh, or you'll be prosecuted. Do not share Christian teaching in church or among your friends. Uh, that's that's the that's really what holistic equality means for Christians. And I guess the encroachment, not only on personal beliefs, but then into what your church is teaching or preaching, uh, you've got here an opportunity for state to begin to dominate Christian beliefs, to really trample over freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, and even potential for uh, overtaking uh, some authoritarian way of what your church teaches and preaches. In other words, trying to trying to curtail what the Bible teaches is true. It's true, absolutely true, Neil. All right, let's 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 check up on one of those significant things we've been following over previous weeks, and that is the Calvary Hospital takeover. Uh, you've got a special webinar happening with ACL this coming Thursday night, and uh, you'll be talking about freedom of religion. Uh, do you know what's happening in any sort of update sense about what's happening with Calvary Hospital, Dan? Well I, well, I do, Neil, um, having been uh, tipped off by uh, a great Christian journalist, Neil Johnson, I was able just a short time ago to see footage of the cross from Calvary, um, you know, being shipped out on a truck uh, past Calvary Hospital, a big, beautiful blue cross. So while the Christians were at church yesterday, including myself in Canberra, um, 
the trucks and the cranes, as we forecast, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, Neil, were busy uh, removing the cross and the uh, religious imagery from that hospital. And that's that's an appalling thing to see. All right, there's a, there's a tip-off uh, in, in so far as me saying, uh, I think the cross is coming down today. Uh, but I said to Dan just before we came on air, uh, Dan, it seems to be that it's Calvary Hospital that has done the removal of the cross. And my suspicion is to preserve the cross, maybe for a relocation of it uh, into some other significant place, uh, rather than the ACT government actually doing the forced removal, which might have meant that the cross could have been destroyed. So if you've seen the video, Dan, what's the, what does the video show? Is the, is the uh, cross intact? Look, oh, the cross is intact. It's on the back of a truck. But here's the thing, Neil. I don't accept for a moment that, you know, this is Calvary removing the cross this is basically the government removing the cross. Yes. Because the government's saying, we're taking over. We don't want any religious imagery uh, come tomorrow, July 3. So get rid of it. So, you know, yeah, Calvary's, Calvary's taking the cross down, but that's a technicality. The reality is that the government has basically demanded the removal of this cross. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a very sad thing. This is a, a, this is a hostile takeover, Neil. Um, and there's no doubt about it. And... Uh, Neil, you mentioned a webinar on Thursday night. Um, one of the people who has been very central in this debate uh, has been the opposition leader here in the ACT, Jeremy Hansen. Um, Jeremy Hansen uh, will join our webinar on Thursday night, and that webinar will uh, address submissions that can be made to the Senate about this hostile takeover. We can't stop the takeover, but we can have an inquiry, and there is one underway in the Senate, as to what happened, uh, so that this doesn't happen to other hospitals, Christian schools uh, in other states uh, that might be at risk. So we're ventilating these issues uh, on Thursday night. And if people join us, and they can through our website, uh, they'll be able to actually write their submission that night. We'll equip them and train them in what to say. Almost out of time, Dan, uh, but we've been speculating and uh, you've been saying the ACT government ha must have some sort of a grand plan in place because they're taking over Calvary Hospital and the reason being quite obvious because Calvary Hospital has a pro-life stance around issues like abortion and uh, end-of-life euthanasia. Um, development two on the weekend around the ACT government, what's that one? Well, surprise, surprise. Uh, they're all very excited about euthanasia. They've launched uh, a big speech and a big report in Parliament uh, last week, and it's all about providing euthanasia to anyone um, uh, as young as 14. Uh, you know, uh, people who uh, they think, the government thinks, um, you know, is a mature minor, um, uh, who has, you know, some um, uh, eligible, eligible illness, uh, can uh, apply. So, um, yeah, this is literally days before the cross comes down, Neil. We, we forecast this some weeks ago. This is what the government is excited about, and um, it's onwards and upwards for this government, which um, operates a little bit like, like a dictatorship because uh, they almost can't be removed, Neil, because um, it's a Labor town largely um, occupied by public servants uh, who depend on a Labor government. And I guess in case there's any doubt that this is somehow rather not pro-life issue related, uh, I saw a quote from the ACT Health Minister who's reported as saying, there will be more opportunities for our acute hospitals to work together without having to manage a complex contractual relationship to deliver improved models of, rare, of, of care and service. I guess that's another way of saying it's no longer pro-life and now all the hospitals will be able to work seamlessly together in a abortion and euthanasia environment. And for listeners to follow through, and my encouragement is uh, to continue and, and you may even, even increase your support for the Australian Christian Lobby in the good work that they do. You can check out details of these sorts of things we're talking about today at acl.org.au. Uh, become part of the team, become part of their standing army and all of the campaigns that they're running. Uh, if you're looking to have a voice, not just a voice, but also action, uh, look to the Australian Christian Lobby. Dan Flynn is Deputy Director of the Australian Christian Lobby. Dan, thanks so much for another great update today on 2020. That's my pleasure, Neil. Thank you. 